Whoa. Right. So I've completed all of the stone collars in here for the marginal zones, and I'm now at the stage where I am filling these areas with gravel. And as I say frequently on these sort of jobs, it's these finishing touches, these stages, that are part of a project where it really starts to come together and it starts to look like a finished project. So I've trimmed off some offcuts of pond liner to make sure that none of this gravel is in contact with the main pond liner. And I've got three different zones here that I'm gonna fill up with some gravel. This is just a basic 10 mil golden shingle, nothing fancy, looks nice underwater. It's a fine enough aggregate that marginal plants can root in it quite happily. And it's a nice sort of heavy medium, growing medium, so it'll allow the plants to really root into it and to remain anchored nicely. Um, if I was using this with larger fish, um, this pond is predominantly going to be a goldfish pond and you know there's not really large carp or, or large koi in here. Um, I'd probably then finish off with a layer of 20 mil gravel on top just to make sure that the fish can't rummage around and root about in the gravel. But in this instance the 10 mil is going to work fine um, and I think it looks nicer as well than a, a 20 mil gravel. So we'll get this in the zones. Go, just enough to hold the liner down and then I can pour it all in. Now this stuff is very very dusty, it's going to want a bit of a rinse and you'll probably find that every time you swoosh around in the gravel to try and plant something or move it, there'll be a little cloud of kind of orangey golden dust in the water, but don't worry, perfectly normal, it's harmless and it will clear very quickly. Now I needed to make sure that I've got a good four inches of gravel, a deep enough sort of bed for the marginals to root into. And I wanted to make sure, of course, that all of this remains submersed beneath the surface of the pond by a few inches so that we're not breaking the surface of the pond and making it look smaller. So levels here are really, really key. Now, of course, as I've been working, I've been gauging and checking the levels, so I know this is fine. So we're going to bring down a few more barrels of this and it's really starting to come together. So I'm in the pond, head cam on. To be honest, I've got absolutely no idea what you can or can't see, but hopefully you can see that the Little marginal zones here are filled up with the gravel and what a difference that makes. Now these two collars over here and over here I fitted yesterday and so the, the mortar has, has gone off nicely. This is a collar of stone that I added this morning so it needs some cleaning up to do now. Now this has had three or four hours to sort of semi-harden. Yes, I did say semi and harden in the same sentence. I do apologise. And I'm just going to give this a bit of a, a bit of a clean now. So all I'm doing is just scraping away with my little pointing trowel, and then using a paintbrush, I'm going to brush that down. Now this was a four to one mix: two parts soft sand, two parts sharp to one part cement, with the usual little bit of plasticizer mixed in as well. And I want to make sure that I've got bits of grit. You can probably see here, just poking out amongst the mortar as I'm brushing it away. It's those bits of grit from the sharp sand that start to reveal themselves. And in this kind of application where I'm trying to make it look a little bit more natural and rustic, I want to try and encourage and actively see bits of this grit because it's going to blend in an awful lot better with the stonework. You know, I'm not trying to create lovely, neat, heavily troweled pointing here. I want it to end up blending in and when it's had a few weeks underwater and it's got a bit of algae growth on it, I want it to replicate stone. So I'm giving that a brush over and then with a the wet brush, again, I'm just going to give it a light, a light working over. And this moisture, this water, 
is going to wash out just a little bit of the finer sand and a little bit of the cement on the top and reveal even more of the grit from the sharp sand. There we go. So hopefully you can see that here. Now there's going to be a little bit of staining on the rock. Um, I would say tomorrow, but tomorrow is Saturday. Next week when I'm back, I'll just give this a bit of a jet wash over and a wire brush and that'll get rid of any, any cement stains. But you can see this is the finished result. So it's very rough and ready, but it looks a lot more like stone underwater. And once it's got that natural patina of, of algae growth and discoloration, it blends in really nicely. Now you don't want to attempt this until the mortar has had a bit of a chance of hardening and going off. If it's too soft and then you try and put a bit of moisture or water on there, it just ends up being a sloppy mess and not workable whatsoever. There we go. Oh, it's turned out to become a lovely afternoon. It was a bit manky this morning, a little bit of rain. Although in all, on this job, I've only been rained on once, I think. So I've been very, very fortunate. There we go. It's going to be lovely to see all this lot submersed underwater. Monday, next week, I can come along, get the pond fully emptied and drained, give it its final clean and jet wash, and then fill it up with some clean water. And then it's really going to start to look like it's nearing completion. That's an exciting stage. Right, I'll carry on doing this. And then I can start to move on to the cascade, the stream, and get building with that. So that's the pond, empty, drained and cleaned. And this is going to be the last fill. I'm making progress on building the stream and just working my way back to the second spillstone now. It's tricky. I'm being governed by obviously water level on the pond behind it and that dictates the level of all the spills. Normally I don't have to, to sort of operate like that and I can take my levels from the level of the pond and work my way up. So I'm having to be ultra cautious here and work with two different levels. The level of the pond down here and the level of the pond up here. There we go, it's going to be nice to see this filled up. There we go. Nice clean water. Yep. And the stone always looks so much nicer when it's just a little bit wet, doesn't it? Yeah. So it's been a little while since I've videoed any in progress on this job. I've been getting a bit carried away and getting the camera out, I have to say, is very tedious because GoPro always goes wrong. Hopefully it's working now. So I've done the bulk of the rock work on the stream here. I've given it a couple of wet tests just to see how the levels are, are flowing over these spill stones and I'm pleased with the results. It's definitely a stream rather than a cascade. There's a nice drop at the bottom into the bottom pond, but the different levels here are marginal. Obviously this area of ground here is, is pretty level and the bulk of the slope and the difference in height is all happening down here. It's been quite challenging because I've had to pay attention not only to the levels of the pond down here, but also the surface level of this pond, the original pond, to ensure that when I create these pools in the stream here, that the water level is at or lower than the level of this pond. Obviously it would look very artificial if the levels were much higher than the pond and it certainly wouldn't create that natural illusion that the pond is flowing and continuing down the stream into the pond. And we've got a bit of terracotta pipe, some four inch pipe that we've cut into two. One piece laying down in here and one piece in the pond. And the idea is that visibly it will appear that water is flowing through that four inch pipe, discharging into the stream and flowing down into the pond. I've just given the liner and the underlay a bit of a cursory trim. Um, it's a bit scrappy and a bit untidy and it's quite nice that I can start to see the margins and the edges. And also I keep losing tools behind all these overlaps. So again, a good reason to get tidy. Sun's out. It's a nice day, managing to dodge all the showers that I can see around the distance. And hopefully, in the next day or two, this will be done. So here we have the stream running. And I've just been playing around with a little bit of mind your own business, filling up some of these little cracks and voids with one of my staple plants that I like to use around rocks in ponds and streams and cascades. It's a lovely, lovely plant for softening 
stonework and creating a nice natural look. Just adding the gravel and the stones to the base of this stream to conceal all the pond liner really, really makes a massive difference to the appearance of this. So too, just trimming the liner short to its final length and then concealing the edges here with a little bit of soil. This will all get seeded. And once the grass has crept over, starting to creep over the top of this stone and filling these little joints between the stone, it will all really soften up and start to look a lot more natural. Now I think it looks nice when a lot of this rock is concealed. I think of all of this as the structure, as the skeleton of the feature. Um, and it looks a little bit too uniform, a little bit too um, defined for my liking. And so you want plants then to creep over this and soften most of this up. So that what's left is the visible riverbed or stream bed of the, of the cascade and waterfall and stream. And I think that's always then the most natural way of creating something like this. So I'm just giving the liner and the fleece its final trim on this side over here. I've got a pair of scissors that I use exclusively for on liner and rough stuff. And then a pair of scissors that I save just for the fleece. It's actually really, really difficult to try and trim and cut this. It's a very, very tightly woven fabric and you need to have a very sharp pair of uh, scissors or a sharp standing knife to be able to trim that. So I want to make sure that I cut this flush with the top of this stone. And we've got there a good six to eight inches of margin with a liner above water level. So we know that that's not gonna leak. I filled all of the voids behind the rock here with more foam so that any soil that comes over the top of this has minimal or zero contact with water and that's going to help to reduce wicking uh, which is obviously going to reduce water and, and drop the level of the pond during dry weather but what a difference it makes when you've trimmed this now over the course of this job and any job like this I end up doing probably three or four trims before I get down to this final layer you never want to go too mad at once. You can always cut a bit more off but you can't put it back once you've cut it. You can also use a heat gun on high heat or a blowtorch to burn away some of this fleece but I don't fancy getting a naked flame or high heat anywhere near this pond liner so I'm going to do it the old-fashioned way. Right, well, it's nearly the end of the day. I'm just gonna trim this little bit of liner here. And then tomorrow, it's gonna to be finishing off the back of the stream, trying to complete that illusion of that transition between the pond and the stream. And then get some plants in the pond. That's the fun bit. So this could well be the last morning on the job. A few finishing touches here. We're just dropping the level of the pond down to below the gravel marginal zone so that we can get some plants put in. It's a lot easier to do it when the gravel is exposed above water level. It doesn't stir it up quite so much. Again, the use of one of our handy pop-up holding tanks is fantastic for this so we can get it pumped out quick and pump it back in again. Got to finish off the back of the stream. A few rocks that need to be foamed into place and the inlet into the stream that inch and a half hose there. I don't want to leave it sat on top of the pond liner like that. I want to use another one of these Awaza Tridux line of tank connectors so that I can get that hose put down much lower than ground level and actually lower than water level. So it's a lot easier to disguise. So with my hole in the pond liner, I'll simply put that bit through. You can see again, Despite the hole not being perfectly circular, there's a bit of stretch in the pond liner and it's very forgiving. If you haven't made a very neat hole, there's a very, very large back plate on here, so huge margin for error. And then the lock nut would simply thread on here. Now, as I say, I am going to glue this, so I will take this apart, glue it, and then refit it. But there is the sort of fitting that you've got. Now, you can see that as an inlet into the stream it's going to be so much easier to conceal the pipework behind this because it's going to be so much lower than ground level. So that works really well. I also need to say a massive thank you to Charlotte. Technical team, Awaza, thank you very, very much for supplying one of these for us. You uh, got me out of a little bit of trouble. It would have been a long drive to go and get one from uh, my local supplier, so thank you very much. So we're just sinking a few rocks in amongst the border here. Partly out of interest. Aesthetics, it's always nice to blend in a little bit of the 
the surrounding area beside a pond with a few rocks as there's an awful lot of rock that's been used in the pond itself but in that particular position where Dave is now there was quite a steep slope and we needed something in there just to help retain some of that soil so that's been dug down in the ground and that'll look quite nice planted around and then we've got another big blocky stone here it's a difficult shape stone to try to to use and position but because it's got a very obvious right angle at the back I think it's crying out to be used somewhere around this corner here I want to make sure that there's enough planting room so you can plant behind and in front of the rock and like an iceberg the majority of this needs to be concealed below ground level so that needs to be dug down and probably only half of it or even less is going to be exposed above ground level so this is the exciting bit probably my favorite part of any of these construction jobs and pond builds is the planting afterwards adding a little bit of something alive and natural and green to a new pond really propels it into looking like a completed job so we've got a few token gestures of plants here I mean you could end up spending a fortune on getting something like this filled up it's not a Chelsea garden I think it's going to take a season or two to really establish um, so we've got to allow for some of these plants to to mature and grow but some of the plants selected we've got some water forget-me-not myosotus palustris this is the blue native plant and this is a great marginal plant because it's raft forming so it'll end up sending foliage at the water surface slightly above and it will flop over and it will end up rafting on the surface of the pond which is really important for a lot of wildlife uh, newts in particular like to lay their eggs individually on the leaves of water forget-me-nots and then they fold it over and, and uh, sort of conceal the egg within it so that's a really important plant got a couple of clumps of this water forget-me-not gets a bit scrappy after it's flowered as do all sort of terrestrial forget-me-nots as well but all this needs is a little bit of a haircut to deadhead the flowers and suddenly it will look like a, a nice specimen again We've also reclaimed some of the plants from the original pond at the back over here um, in clearing out and opening up that section where the water enters the stream and comes down there's some of this lovely lesser reed mace this is Typha angustifolia a lot of reed mace or bulrush as they're commonly known although incorrectly um, can be a bit thuggy a bit invasive and can get very large but this is a, a much much more ornamental variety it doesn't get too large about a meter and a half in height so that's pretty much fully grown in height and in fact it's just producing its little flowering burrs, its little heads here which when the pollen has left this they end up a lovely rich brown sort of cigar shape and colour. So that's quite attractive for a bit of architectural height and again a few clumps of this. Again cadged from the other pond are some iris versicolor, some little uh, purple flag irises. Again a smaller variety of iris, not going to get too large or thuggy such as the iris pseudocorus, the native yellow flag iris. So that's a much more appropriate plant for a pond of this sort of size. Some of my favorites. Again, if you've seen any of my construction videos, you'll see that I always use pickerel plants, Pondateria. I love this. It's a really late flowering plant. Sadly, ponds, the flowering period seems to be over very, very quickly. Um, and by sort of end of July, August, often there's not an awful lot happening in a pond. The pickerel plant is a much, much later flower and you'll get flowers from this sort of August, September, even on into October. So it's nice that we've got some later flowering plants and I think this lovely tropical waxy foliage looks really, really nice in a pond. Another slightly sort of scrappier raft forming plant is a water mint. And as all mints, they can take over if left to their own devices. But this is a slightly more ornamental version. Uh, Mentha aquatica is the typical native water mint. And this one is Mentha cervina or water spearmint. It's got a gorgeous, gorgeous smell. Same you can't smell it over there. But it smells really, really nice. Lovely flowering, purple um, sort of flower spikes. Great for pollinators. Bees and insects love that one. So I've got a few clumps of that dotted around. A plant I don't often use, they often come across, is this lovely variegated Acorus. This is Acorus calamus variegatus. Uh, sweet flag. It's lovely when you end up breaking one of the leaves and smell that. It really has got a very very sweet smell and again this is a they call it flowering it's not really a flower again it's sort of a burr but it's quite an interesting plant again very architectural grown for its foliage and a nice neat clump forming plant so that's been quite nice to provide a little bit of height over here in the corner. A bit more water forget-me-not, a little bit more water forget-me-not. We've got some more typha 
and we've got a few little sprigs of this fantastic bright colored plant over here which is hetinia a lot of gardeners might be aghast to see this because it does also grow terrestrially out of ponds and again in a border left to its own devices it will send runners and it will just take over and it's quite a difficult plant to get rid of but in a pond confined to these gravel bed areas I would encourage it to start to run through to have seams and ribbons of this bright colour dotted around it's going to look really really nice and then lastly we've got yet another rafting plant this is brooklime or veronica again another native plant um, very low growing sort of a carpeting plant that grows maybe five or six inches in height very small kind of nondescript blue or purple flowers a bit like the water forget-me-not but again a very useful plant for just sending runners out all over the place to soften stonework um, wonderful habitat for wildlife and I think this is going to be quite nice to have in the splash zone around the cascade area we'll get planting and see how it looks so planting in these marginal zones couldn't be easier and it really is a case of pulling away some of the gravel Positioning the plants as you see fit. I think up in the corner like that's going to be nice. Raking the gravel back over, and then if they're just a little bit too deep, it can be pulled up slightly. There we go. Immediately, that's so much more attractive than the traditional plastic baskets that you see in a pond. And this is going to hold and contain the plant in a much more natural way. Mm. Some of this mint. Have a smell of that. Spearmint. Mm. Nice, isn't it? Now, stem plants like this mint are so easy to propagate from, he says, without a pair of secateurs. And you can literally break off a stem, and at every single one of these leaf nodes, they'll root once they're in contact with water. So I can push these down into the gravel and that will form a new plant. And that will form a new plant. And very quickly we'll get a nice screen of mint over in that area. Let's put another one here. Near the edge, as you walk by, and get a bit of a smell of the mint. Lovely. Right, let's go with some of this chorus. Again, have a sniff of that. Really, really sweet, sugary. This is a medicinal plant. Uh, apparently some uses are it can help with um, women's menstrual pains. Other sites say it's a, a highly toxic and dangerous plant, so I wouldn't go using it. But aesthetically, it looks very nice. Oh yeah, you can really smell it. Just working with it. Nice to have some some tall but very neat looking plants in the pond. A little bit of height is very important, but just nothing that's gonna look at a scale in the pond or take over. Now I say take over, most pond plants left to their own devices, if they get the conditions they want, which is water and sunlight and they're going to get both of that a plenty in this pond they will end up taking over and so you always need to do a little bit of plant maintenance once or twice a year be conscious of plants that you don't want to to take over or to spread in certain areas and things like the reed mace for example as they send out their subterranean runners you want to start pulling those out to stop it from popping up in other places but in the gravel like this it's very easy to do so Right, I'm going to finish off planting these 
we'll see what it looks like when I'm done. There we go, all the plants added. It looks rather nice, seeing a bit of foliage, some life in the pond. Some of the taller plants, like the reed mace here, I have halved in height. Um, they're very top heavy and any sort of gusty weather, they're just gonna get knocked over before they even get a chance to establish. So I've trimmed them down a little bit so that the roots can establish, so it can really bind itself into the gravel very well, and then it can be allowed to go up. Uh, we've also got some spotlights in the pond here. Some of the Awaza Lunacqua Power LEDs. I've got four of those, one in each of the marginal zones, and then one acting as an uplighter beneath the spillstone on the cascade. Um, it's gonna look rather nice illuminated. My tummy's rumbling, it's definitely lunchtime. We'll get the pond filled up and see how it looks with water lapping up against the plants. It's time for something to eat. giving the rocks all a bit of a rinse off, clean off some of that soil that's fallen on them. I think the, the rocks, in fact the whole thing always looks so much nicer. And it's got a little bit of water on it, and the stonework of the soil has darkened up a bit. There we go. And then really, the last job, Give it a bit of a skim, get rid of some of these leaves and dust and muck and bits and pieces that have been blown in from cleaning up around the pond. I need to add some anti-blanket retreatment, something I always use as a staple whenever I finish a job like this. The stonework, a little bit of mortar, cement in here, it's all going to buffer the water and make it very hard and alkaline and this is ideal conditions for blanket water to grow. So I want to nip that in the bud before it really takes a hold and causes any issues. I'll come back tomorrow morning, introduce a couple of water lilies, and then at the same time, I'll add a dose of blanket answer, which is gonna clear the pond. So here's the finished stream, planted up with lots and lots of bits and pieces of mind your own business. At the moment, they just look like they've been plonked there, which they have. But give it a few weeks, and very, very quickly, this mind your own business starts to take and it starts to creep over all that rock. And I'll show you an example in a minute of an established stream that I built a few years ago, which is covered in my own business. But the intention here was always to try and create that effect that the top pond was flowing down into this bottom pond. And so we've gone with the, trying to create the effect of water coming out through a pipe from one to another with a little bit of a, a land bridge between the two. And I think that's worked pretty efficiently. And as you can see, the one end of the pipe in the pond, and it looks like it's flowing through the pipe and coming out this end, and then flowing back down into the pond. So this is how it all started for me on this pond. This stream you can see over at the back of the pond was something that I, I put in about seven or eight years ago. And you can see here that Mind Your Own Business is really at home. And what a fantastic job it does of just softening up all the stonework and creating just a really nice natural looking screen. It's a lovely position up here on the deck, having water to the left of you and water to the right. And yeah, that does sound like a Bob Dylan song. But it's lovely, you've got the sound of water up here from one cascade and then just behind me I can hear the sound of the water from the other one. And when this is cleared, and when it's established, when we've got some fish in here, it's going to be a really nice place to sit up here and to look down into the pond from this elevated position. Ideal place for it. So, this really is the end of the job now. It's amazing to think that a few weeks ago there was nothing here but a bit of grass and with some hard work and a bit of graft end up with something like this. So I'm very pleased. 
Now obviously it's still very new and the rock, particularly being Purbeck, being this very light colour, it's going to take a year or two to really start to dull down and blend in with the original pond that was here already. But it will, with a bit of patience, a little bit of plant growth, and it'll all start to dull down and look a lot more natural and like it's been here for a long time. Now if you follow me, I've got another project that I'm starting next week, uh, which will take three or four weeks time. It's a, a pond restoration, I'll get that posted out soon. And also I've still yet to complete my own pond in my own garden, which I'm really, really close to finishing. I started that last August. I can't let it take a year for me to finish it, so I've really got to pull my finger out and crack on with that and find some time. But I'll post the last video of that very soon as well. Otherwise, thank you very much for viewing. Uh, I really appreciate all the views and the new subscribers that I have. It amazes me how the channel has been growing, which is amazing. Very nice, thank you. But as ever, thanks very much for watching this project. I'm Ed from Crystal Clear Aquatics and I'll see you in the next pond.